In the latest episode of our podcast, Into the Killing, we cover the case of a 15-year-old boy who went missing in 1987. The police had a suspect. It was a man who was first convicted of murdering a child when he was just 15 years old. The police also believe that the man killed other young men. Yet, it would still take a decade before there was a break in the case of the missing 15-year-old boy. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, Stitcher, and anywhere you find great podcasts. Just before we start today's video, we're going to take a few moments to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Magellan TV. When the weather gets to be unbearable, I love sitting inside and watching a great documentary. Magellan TV has the best collection of documentaries to choose from. The next one, one I watched last week is called Mafia in Italy, A Bloody Pact. The documentary is utterly fascinating. In 1992, two anti-mafia magistrates were murdered in Sicily. For a long time, it was thought that the mafia was behind the murders. But the documentary shows that the murders were much more complex and people in the Italian government may have been involved. Mafia in Italy, a bloody pact, is an absolute must-watch. I also really enjoyed the history documentary after Braveheart. 1995's Braveheart, starring and directed by Mel Gibson, is a fantastic movie. But the events depicted in the epic film were only the start of the Scots' fight for independence. After Braveheart looks at the war after the death of William Wallace. After Braveheart is available in 4K and it's absolutely stunning to watch. We are so thankful that Magellan TV has been a longtime sponsor. Right now is the best time to sign up because Magellan TV has an amazing, exclusive offer for criminally listed viewers. You can get 30% off an annual membership. That means you get access to over 3,000 documentaries for just $3.50 a month. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed to claim your discounted annual membership today. If you've been watching with me and you let your subscription lapse, that's no problem. You can still claim this offer. So check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. James Wonder In April 2008, Donald Pettit was 52 years old. He lived in Pembroke Pines, Florida with his wife and his two daughters. Donald had served 20 years in the Army and for 15 years he worked for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In January 2008, he became an agent with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. On April 5, 2008, Donald was driving to the post office and his 12-year-old daughter, Gabriella, was in the back seat. A man driving a car in front of him was going slowly and Donald was tailgating the man. The man suddenly slammed on his brakes, but Donald was able to stop in time. Donald pulled down in front of the man and slammed on his brakes. They did this several times to each other and gave each other the finger. Then Pettit pulled into the parking lot of the post office and parked his car. The man driving the other car pulled into the same parking lot. Gabriella heard her father and the other man argue. She heard the man yell at her father and then he said, Who do you think you are, Slick? She then heard a gunshot. The man got into his car and drove away. 12-year-old Gabriella got out of the car and she found her 52-year-old father unresponsive on the ground. He had been shot once in the back of the head. Someone called 911. Sadly, it was too late to save 52-year-old Donald Pettit. The father of two died at the scene. A massive search was conducted for the shooter. 500 officers from the local, state, and federal levels were involved. Roadblocks were set up and even Black Hawk helicopters were used. The authorities were actually criticized for their response. They responded by saying that most people volunteered their time. Hours after the shooting, someone called Crime Stoppers and told them that the shooter was a 65-year-old retired man named James Wonder. 
The day after the shooting, a SWAT team surrounded the building where Wonder got his kidney dialysis. It was just a few blocks from the post office. Wonder surrendered without incident. Wonder had dyed his hair with motor oil and he was driving a rental car. Wonder was interviewed at the police station and he admitted to shooting Donald. He said that he had a gun in his waistband which he was allowed to have on him because he had a permit to carry a concealed weapon. Wonder said that he was a frail man and he had been undergoing dialysis for three years since he suffered renal failure. Also, in his left arm, he had a surgically placed fistula. He was worried that if he was attacked, it would burst and kill him. Wonder said that Donald made him feel afraid for his life, so he pulled the gun out of his waistband, turned off the safety, and shot him. Then he got into his car and drove away. Wonder was initially charged with first degree murder. In October 2012, over four years after the shooting, there was a trial to see if James Wonder could use Florida's controversial stand your ground law as a defense. Wonder testified that he was on his way to his dialysis treatment on the day of the shooting. Along the way, he and Donald played chicken and they followed him in to the post office's parking lot. Wonder testified that Donald started screaming at him and he was afraid that he would get beaten up. But Wonder admitted that Donald never said anything specifically threatening. Wonder claimed that Donald charged at him like a football player, so he shot him. Wonder said that when he shot Donald, he wasn't trying to kill him. Instead, he was simply trying to stop him. The prosecutor pointed out that there were a lot of problems with Wonder's story. For example, if Wonder was so frail and worried about his own safety, why did he follow Donald into the parking lot and get out of his car? Why didn't he just continue on to his appointment? Also, even according to Wonder's own testimony, Donald never made any physical threats or said anything that could be interpreted that violence was imminent. Wonder also claimed that Donald was charging at him when he shot him. But Gabriella said she heard Wonder say, Who do you think you are, Slick? He then had time to pull out his gun, turn off the safety, and shoot Donald. Also, if Donald was charging at him, how did Donald get shot in the back of the head? Another problem is if Wonder was truly acting in self-defense, why didn't he stay at the scene after the shooting? Why didn't he call 911? After the shooting, why did he dye his hair and rent a car? The judge ruled that James Wonder could not use the standard ground law as a defense. James Wonder appealed in August 2014. The appeal was upheld. In February 2017, the judge ruled that Wonder's arrest was illegal, but the charges were still valid. That meant that Wonder's interview after he was taken into custody and some evidence that was found at his house would not be admissible when he went to trial. However, anything that Wonder said at the Stand Your Ground trial in 2012 where he admitted to shooting Donald Pettit could be used against him at his trial. So the state was ready to proceed to try Wonder for manslaughter. Wonder's trial was set for August 2017 nine years after the shooting. But no record can be found if he actually went to trial. So it's possible he made some type of plea deal or he died before the trial. But no obituary for Wonder could be found. Also, a search of Florida's inmate database shows no record of James Wonder having ever served time or being on parole. So it's unclear what happened to James Wonder after his arrest was declared illegal. What is known is that Donald Pettit's children had to grow up without a father. Number 2. Donald Bell Sunday, May 6, 2001, 
was a beautiful but hot day in Sacramento, California. Nancy Mann's 53-year-old husband, Timothy Mann, and her 28-year-old son, Michael Mann, had taken her out for crepes to celebrate her birthday. Nancy had been going through a bit of a rough patch. A few weeks earlier, she had lost her job at IBM. But Nancy still had a lot to look forward to. She and Timothy had recently booked a cruise for that autumn. They had gone on their first cruise a year earlier to celebrate their 30th wedding anniversary. Timothy worked as a linesman for the Municipal Power District. Also out on the roads that Sunday morning was 52-year-old Donald Bell and his 15-year-old son. Donald was a construction worker. They were planning on repairing the boy's scooter and then they were going out to the shooting range. Donald and his son were in his pickup truck on the six-lane highway. They were heading to the hobby shop to pick up something for the scooter. Donald merged onto an off-ramp, but then he realized he didn't want to get off at that exit. So he merged back onto the highway right in front of the Mann family. Nancy said that Timothy had to slam on his brakes when Donald merged back onto the highway. Donald said that he thought that Timothy revved up and boxed him in. Regardless, Timothy and Donald pulled their vehicles up next to each other. Through open windows, they yelled at each other and made rude hand gestures. About three miles later, Timothy exited the highway on an off-ramp. Donald pulled off on the same exit, claiming it was the one he wanted to take to get to the hobby shop. Timothy pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway and Donald parked about 20 feet behind him. Timothy's family begged him to stay in the car, but he refused. He got out of his car and Donald got out of his pickup truck. Donald had a handgun on him and he held it up, aiming it at Timothy's chest. What happened next isn't exactly clear. Either 53-year-old Timothy Mann took a roundhouse swing at 52-year-old Donald Bell, or Timothy tried to grab the gun. Regardless, Donald shot Timothy in the head while his son and Timothy's family watched on. Donald's 15-year-old son screamed, You killed him! Timothy's son, 28-year-old Michael, got out and tried to help his father. But Donald's son was right. 53-year-old Timothy Mann had died nearly instantly. The police arrived shortly afterward and Donald Bell was arrested for manslaughter. Not long after Donald was arrested, he was released on bond. He maintained that he never intended to shoot Timothy. He told a reporter that Timothy hit him harder than a mule kick and his punch caused the gun to go off. On the morning of May 20th, 2001, three weeks to the day of Timothy Mann's death, 52-year-old Donald Bell called 911. He told the operator that he had been involved in the deadly shooting and he was heading to the location where it had happened. He said that he was going to serve justice on himself by killing himself. Donald said he was sorry for everything he had done. He said that he brought terrible misery on everyone. He said his only hope was that God would forgive him. Then, when Donald arrived at the spot where he shot Timothy three weeks earlier, he parked his pickup truck and hung up his phone. Witnesses saw him walk over to the makeshift memorial that had been made for Timothy. The 52-year-old Donald Bell shot himself in the head. Like Timothy, he died at the scene. Both families thought that the situation was a tremendously senseless and needless tragedy. Timothy's widow, Nancy, said that the tragedy could have easily been avoided. She thinks that they probably would have never gone confrontational with each other if they knew what was at stake. 
Number one, LV Utah Williams. In the summer of 1997, 34-year-old Travis James was going through a rough time. Months earlier, in May, he had pleaded guilty to one count of possessing a drug to sell. He was scheduled to be sentenced in mid-August. Travis lived with his 28-year-old girlfriend, Wendy Witt, and their two children, 6-year-old Sariza and 2-year-old Robert, in Hesperia, California. They were evicted from their home on August 1st. They found a new apartment across town. They spent August 1st moving their belongings to their new apartment. On their last trip back home, the traffic on Main Street was pretty heavy. Travis was driving a Chevrolet Impala. Wendy was in the passenger seat, Sariza was in the back seat, and Robert was in a car seat in the back seat. For unknown reasons, several men in a Chevrolet Camaro took a dislike to Travis and the driver started to swerve into his car. The car in front of Travis was driving slowly. Travis tried to pass the car, but the driver of the Camaro cut him off and wouldn't let him pass. Travis slowed down and sped up, attempting to get around the Camaro. The driver of the Camaro tried to do everything he could to make sure Travis couldn't pass. Then, when they came up to a left-hand turning lane, Travis pulled into it, hoping to pass the Camaro. Then the man, sitting in the Camaro's passenger seat, leaned over the driver and fired several shots into the family's car. Then the shooting stopped. But, it was only temporary. Seconds later, the passengers started firing more bullets. In total, the family's car was hit 13 times. Travis came to a stop and he realized that neither he nor Wendy had been shot. They looked in the back seat and their six-year-old daughter, Sariza, was unharmed. Tragically, a bullet went through Robert's teddy bear and into his head. Travis raced to the hospital. But it was too late to save Robert. He was three weeks shy of his third birthday. Robert was cremated and his ashes were placed in the family's home with his favorite Batman doll. Robert had been obsessed with Batman and he was even wearing Batman shoes when he was shot. In 1997, Hesperia had a population of about 60,000 people so it wasn't a large city. The citizens were shocked and outraged by the shooting. They didn't think that type of crime happened in their city. The police launched a massive investigation and asked for witnesses to come forward. Unfortunately, road rage incidents are hard to solve because it's stranger on stranger crime. Stranger on stranger crime is some of the hardest cases to solve. Witnesses are also hard to find because people are just passing through the area and they may not even realize that a road rage incident is going on. But, in this case, the police got lucky. Someone saw the shooter and described him to a sketch artist. The police also knew that the killer was traveling in a medium blue mid-1980s Chevy Camaro with a horizontal stripe that fades from white to gray. In the back windows of the Camaro, there were lovers. Unfortunately, while the police had a description of the shooter and the car, they did not make any arrests in the wake of the murder. Nearly a year later, a reward of $35,000 was offered for information leading to an arrest. Not long afterward, the police received an anonymous tip. The caller said that a 26-year-old man named Alvy Utah Williams may have been the shooter. When the police received the tip, Williams was in a state prison for an unrelated gun charge. Williams had a lengthy criminal history. The police were able to track down the driver of the car and another passenger who was in the car. They agreed to testify against Williams. 
William's grandmother even agreed to testify against him. So Williams was arrested in mid-August 1998, nearly a year after the shooting. Alvy Williams went to trial in 2003. At the trial, Williams' grandmother said that Williams said he was happy that the boy had died. After she said that in court, Williams shouted out that he didn't say that. The prosecutor told the jury that Williams' reaction showed he had a hair-trigger temper. Alvy Williams was ultimately convicted of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Williams' lawyer appealed his conviction. In September 2005, his conviction was overturned. A committee determined that the lawyer should not have said anything about Williams' reaction in relation to his temper. Williams was ordered to stand trial again. But instead of going to trial, in 2009, Williams agreed to a plea deal. He pleaded no contest of voluntary manslaughter and he was given a sentence of 11 years. Because of time served, he didn't have to serve any more prison time and he was released on parole. Since his plea deal, Alvy Williams has stayed out of prison and now the media spotlight. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our podcast, Into the Killing. In our latest episode, we look at a suspected serial killer who almost got away with murder. You can find Into the Killing on Deezer, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.